United Methodist Church and Centenary United Methodist Church in Salt Lake City, Utah. As we prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning, we invite you into a time of prayer and reflection during this morning's prelude. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. My name is AJ. I'm the pastor here, and I'd like to welcome each and every one of you. As we are gathering, if you would say hello, good morning in the comments. Let us know if you're awake this morning or not on this uh, time change. We're so glad that you're joining us now, or if you end up sleeping in and joining us later, that's okay, too. That's the, the joy of online worship. So um, welcome to all of you, especially if you're a guest or a visitor. We want to say a special welcome to you. If you'd like to know more about our church, you can put connect in the comments and someone will be in touch with you. So today there are two things about our service that I want to lift up as we begin this morning. First is that today or this weekend is actually the one year anniversary of when our sanctuaries closed and church worship went online because of the pandemic. So it's hard to believe that it's been a full year. Um, but we're going to take some time later in the service to just kind of honor that and have a moment of silence to remember all that has happened this year. Second, we are continuing our Lenten sermon series where we are asking the question, where is God in the world? 
we're going to be talking about the God that is found uh, when we do justice in the world. And so as we think about both of those things today, I know there's a little bit of overlap that this uh, pandemic has exposed some of the injustices in our world and that there's a lot to hold with both of those things. Um, but we're going to begin today with a prayer. And in the vein of justice, I want to share a prayer with you this morning um, that is from Black Liturgies and is written by a black woman named Cole Riley Author. And this is her prayer for justice. So let us be in prayer together. God of justice, we thank you for being a God who is unconcerned with spiritual practices that don't affirm the dignity of the most vulnerable among us. Keep us from shallow spiritualities that are more concerned with obedience to ritual than how that ritual should bring about justice and restoration in the world. If we fast, let it be in that ancient way which gives our portions to the hungry and oppressed. Grant that we would find our own healing magnified as we participate in the healing of the nations. Let our darkest nights become like noonday, that we would look up in the light and see no less than the very face of God in one another. Amen. We invite you now to join us in our opening hymn, and this is considered uh, the Black Anthem, and we're going to have a little history about this hymn before we sing it. But if you'd like to stand and join in singing, we invite you to do that. Let us sing.
Amen and amen. Lift our voices and sing. We are still here. Our scripture reading for today is the book of Exodus, chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. Now a man from Levi's household married a Levite woman. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that the baby was healthy and beautiful, so she hid him for three months. When she couldn't hide him any longer, she took a reed basket and sealed it up with black tar. She put the child in the basket and set the basket among the reeds at the river bank. The baby's older sister stood watch nearby to see what would happen to him. Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river. While her women servants walked along the, beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and she sent one of her servants to bring it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child the boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. She said, this must be one of the Hebrews children. Then the baby sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, would you like me to go and find one of the Hebrews women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter agreed, yes, do that. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me, and I'll pay you for your work. So the woman took the child and nursed it. After the child had grown up, she brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her son. The name, she named him Moses because she said, I pulled him out of the water. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this morning we gather once again to consider this question, where is God in our world? And as we think about this today, I want to expand on our conversation from last week, where we talked about the importance of finding God in loving our neighbor. Because you see, if we truly want to love our neighbor, we must also be willing to work for justice in the world. African-American author, scholar, and philosopher Cornel West put it this way. He said, justice is what love looks like in public. And indeed, this is what justice is all about. Justice is about creating a loving world in which everyone's human dignity is honored. Justice is about creating loving systems and policies that do not cause harm to our neighbors. And justice is ultimately about how we love God and how we love neighbor. And this no notion of justice is completely consistent with our scriptural tradition. For example, in the book of Micah, the prophet asks us to consider, what does it really mean to have a relationship with God? What does God really want from us? Does God want our burnt offerings or our firstborn child? Does God want 10,000 extravagant rivers of oil? No, the prophet writes, but what does the Lord require of you but to act justly? and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. 
In addition, the prophet Isaiah talks about how the light of God's presence is found when we do the work of justice. He writes, If you get rid of unfair practices, and if you quit blaming victims, and if you are generous with the hungry and start giving yourselves to the down and out, then your lives will begin to shine in the darkness and your shadowed lives will be bathed in sunlight. Then you'll be known as those who can fix anything, restore old ruins, rebuild and renovate, make the community livable again. Isn't that just the best definition of justice? To make the community livable again. And indeed, this is what justice is all about. Justice is about making a livable world for all God's children. And over and over again, our scriptural tradition calls on us to do this work. Calls on us to seek and to find God in our world by getting rid of unfair practices and by making our communities livable again and by standing up for what is right. In fact, this is what our scripture reading this morning is all about. This ancient story is about some pretty amazing and pretty smart women, I would have to say. And yes, it was International Women's Day this past week, and so today we're going to be telling some stories about some pretty amazing women, including the women in our scripture story. You see, for these women, their community was being disrupted. And yet they had the courage to stand up for what was right. In the book of Exodus, we are told that although the Israelites had lived in Egypt for quite a while, a new pharaoh came to power, and he was feeling a little threatened by this group of people. And so in order to disrupt their community, he pulled aside these two Hebrew midwives named Sifra and Pua, and he told them, When you are helping the Hebrew women give birth and you see the baby being born, if it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, you can let her live. But you know, these two midwives, being the strong women that they were, chose to disobey Pharaoh and to let all of the babies live. Because they would not let this king disrupt their community nor their own sense of justice. And during the same time, we have that story of Moses' mother that we read today. She was another strong woman who stood up for the life of her child by taking a reed basket and sealing it up with black tar and putting that child in the basket and risking setting it in the reeds among the riverbank where Pharaoh's daughter would come to bathe. And indeed, Pharaoh's daughter did come down to the river, and when she saw the basket and the boy crying in it, she surprisingly did not turn the child over to the authorities, nor did she leave the child in the water to drown. But instead, she took in this child, this refugee, into her own home and into her own family, and by doing so, so stood against the will of her own father. You see, all throughout the story, the midwives and Moses' mother and Pharaoh's daughter and even Miriam all stand up for what is right and stand against the powers that would disrupt their communities with hatred and violence. And because they did this, God's presence was made known in that place. God's power was made known in the blessing of the midwives and in the faithfulness of Moses' mother in the bravery of Pharaoh's daughter, and eventually even in that little child named Moses, who would eventually lead his people to liberation. You see, God's presence is found when we stand up for what is right, and when we tend to God's justice and liberation in the world. And so if we want to find God's presence in our lives, If we want to know where God is and what God is up to in the world, then we must be willing to participate in the work of justice, as well as to position ourselves to be prepared for this work. 
You know, oftentimes when we tell stories about justice, we often talk only about the big moments of change, or the famous people who took part in a famous protest that everyone knows about. But what we don't often talk about is the behind the scenes work. What we don't often talk about is the years of learning and growing and spiritual grounding that can go into one big moment. For example, I remember growing up and hearing the story of Rosa Parks sitting on the bus during the Jim Crow era. At the time, I thought she was just one individual who happened to do something brave. But it wasn't until I got older and started studying the civil rights movement more in depth that I realized Rosa Parks was part of an entire movement of justice. That for years she had gone to meetings of the NAACP and that she had studied the issues at hand and, and she had gone to church and had practiced believing that she was worthy of that seat on the bus. Rosa Parks, a little like our women in the scripture story today, was well positioned and well grounded in her own spiritual tradition and in a supportive community that helped her to sit on the bus that day. So you see, getting positioned to do the work of justice is important. And we must continuously be praying and learning and working towards what is just and right. And so today I want to lift up a few things that we could do in our everyday lives to better position ourselves towards justice. First, one of the things that we can always do is learn more about the issues in our community. For example, since I moved to Salt Lake City last year, I have heard about the issue of affordable housing in our city but I really didn't know that much about it. And so this week I spent some time learning more about the issue and I learned a lot of different things, but one of the shocking things I discovered is that under the current law, an affordable housing unit can cost as much as $1,234 per month. Now, not all units cost that much, but under the law, it can cost that much and still be considered affordable. Which, if you know anything about rent and costs, that is not a very affordable monthly rent. And so now, because I learned this, I am better positioned to advocate for truly affordable housing in our community. And the next time I hear that word affordable, I'll be more intentional to ask what that really means and how that word is being defined. Because the more we know about the issues in our community, the better we can stand up for what is right. Second, another way that we can become better positioned for justice in the world is to pay attention to the voices and stories and people that we surround ourselves with. For example, if you are a white person and you only listen to white newscasters or only read white authors or only shop at white-owned stores, or even only listen to white preachers, then your own experience does not reflect the diversity of God's creation around us. And so in order to become better positioned for justice, we need to expand and diversify the things that we are looking at, or the voices that we are hearing, or the images that we are consuming, so that we can be better equipped to stand up for what is really needed. For example, we read today a prayer from a black author, and we're going to hear a song a little bit later from a black musician, so that we can diversify the voices that we hear even within our own worship service. And third, as spiritual people, we also need to continuously ground ourselves in our spiritual practices as we work for justice. For example, when you look at almost all of the major justice icons throughout history, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, Mandela, Dorothy Day, Rosa Parks, they were all part of a spiritual tradition, and they relied on that spiritual lineage to do the work that they did. In fact, Rosa Parks was a member of an African Methodist Episcopal Church, 
And it was her faith that helped her sit on the bus that fateful day in December 1955. Rosa recounted that, I instantly felt God give me the strength to endure whatever would happen next. God's peace flooded my soul and my fear melted away. I knew that all people were equal in the eyes of God and I was going to live like a free person. Practicing our faith, studying God's word, spending time in prayer, and rooting ourselves in our spiritual tradition are all things that we can do to better position ourselves for the work of justice in the world. And finally, of course, when the moment arises, we, like Rosa Parks, have to be willing to act. We have to be willing to show up and to sit on the bus, or to disobey the Pharaoh, or to put the child in the basket, or perhaps even to go against our own family, like Pharaoh's daughter did, all in the name of justice. Because once we know what the issues are that are disrupting our communities, and once we know what God is calling us to do, we have to be willing to act. For when we position ourselves to act for justice, we will be positioned to find exactly where God resides in our world. To see our God who resides in a world where the oppressed go free, where justice rolls on like a river, and where our communities are made livable again. For this is what it means to truly love our neighbors, and this is what it means to truly love our God. Therefore, I invite you today to remember the sacred stories of our ancestors that teach us the importance of standing up for what is right. And I invite you to take the time to position yourself, not just to love your neighbor, but to be brave enough and wise enough to work for justice and peace. And I invite you to root and ground yourselves in the sacred tradition of God's justice in the world. For when we do this, we will come to know that spirit of God that resides right here in our midst. On that note, I would like to leave you today with a song that I think speaks to this work and to the ancient wisdom of our ancestors who remind us who we are. This song is performed by Dr. Issei Barnwell, an African-American woman and musical activist. In this performance that you are about to see, Dr. Issei sings her original song, We Are, for an event at the Bishop John T. Walker School for Boys. This school is named in honor of the first black bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington and is a tuition-free, independent school for boys living in the underserved neighborhoods east of the Anacosta River in Washington, D.C., and in Maryland's Prince George County. Dr. Issei's performance was recorded in Bethlehem Chapel in the Washington National Cathedral as part of the school's 2021 annual dinner. And this event supports more than 30% of the school's operating budget. The school has graciously given us the permission to share this video with you today. And if you'd like to learn more about their work for justice and peace in the world, you can visit bishopwalkerschool.org or search for them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. This is We Are, performed by Dr. Issei Barnwell. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. Oh, for each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. We are our grandmother's prayers. We are our grandfather's dreamings, and we are the birth of our ancestors. We 
are the spirit of God. We are mothers of courage and fathers of time. Daughters of dust and the sons of great visions. We're sisters of mercy and brothers of love. Lovers of life, we are the builders of nations. We're seekers of truth and keepers of faith. We are makers of peace. We are the wisdom of ages. We are our grandmother's ways. We are our grandfather's dreamings. And we are the breath of our ancestors. We are the spirit of God. We are mothers of courage and fathers of time. Daughters of dust and the sons of great visions, we're sisters of mercy, brothers of love, lovers of life, we are the builders of nations, we're seekers of truth and keepers of faith, we are makers of peace, we are the wisdom of ages, we are our grandmother's prayers, we our grandfather's dreamings and we are the breath of our ancestors we are the spirit of God we are one 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 let us pray. God of justice, we give thanks for each child that is born, for each morning star that rises to remind us who we are. For indeed, we are a people of love and justice a people whose ancestors call us to stand up for our neighbors and to reach down towards the child in the reeds, a people called by you to usher in your kingdom and to stand up for what is right. So today, O oh Lord, position us for the work of justice in the world. Position us to use our voice to speak up for what is right and to advocate for a community that is livable for all. For when we do this, we will hear the ancient rhythm of the sacred reminding us who we are. We are one. May it be so. Amen. As we move into our time of communion, I invite you to join us in singing our communion hymn, Breath of God, Breath of Peace.
come and be fed. But we cannot be satisfied with just this experience of justice, especially when the world around us is not the same. So we must take the, the food that we receive here, the breath of God that we receive here, the strength from this table, and take it out into the world until the world is equal for all. And so we invite you to come to experience this table, but also to be fed to go out into the world to work for justice. In the United Methodist Church, you do not need to be a member of this church or any church to come and receive this meal. So if you are worshiping with us today, if you have a piece of bread or some, a cracker, some juice, water, whatever you have, join us in this holy meal. For we remember when Jesus was with his disciples that he took bread, he gave thanks for it, and he gave it to them and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Every time you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. Likewise, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks for it, and gave it to his disciples and said, this is the cup of a new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. Would you join me in placing your hands over your elements as we join in prayer? Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his love. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until everyone can come and feast at Christ's heavenly banquet. And now, as one body of Christ, let us join together in saying the prayer that Jesus taught us in whatever language is most comfortable for you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is the bread of life broken for you. Thanks be to God. You may now partake of your elements. of the pandemic really officially beginning for a lot of us here. Um, if you have other prayers that you would like to share with us today, of course, you um, put those in the comments as we always do. Um, but today we're just going to take a moment to pause and to hold all that has happened in this past year. We hold all of those who have died. We hold all of those who are still uh, ling have lingering side effects and issues because of contracting the virus. We hold all of those who have felt alone or isolated during this time. We hold all of those who are struggling with addictions or relapses. All of the things that this pandemic has brought. It has been a very hard and challenging and long year. And so we just want to take a moment now to light this candle and to hold a moment of silence for this year and for this one year anniversary. So let us be in silence together.
Let us pray. Merciful God, it has been a long year. We miss the comfort of warm hugs, the connection of shared meals and friendly visits. We remember those who have died, those who are still sick. We remember all of those who have faced hardship and difficulty in this year. O oh God, your world is suffering, and we need your presence now. Visit us with your mercy, O oh God. Shepherd us like the good shepherd you are, who tends to the flocks and carries their burdens and watches over us while others sleep. Visit us with your mercy, O oh God, and give us peace. Amen.
We come into our time of prayer now where we lift up the prayers of our community. We have prayers from Casey Decker for the family of John Kerrigan, whose wife lost her courageous battle with cancer. So we remember the John Kerrigan family. Um, prayers from Betty for Margaret Warwick, who is back in the hospital. From Lois, prayers for Mary File, who is struggling with her health and hospice. So we lift up Mary. And blessings and thanksgiving for our beautiful music this morning. If you have other prayers that you'd like us to, to know about or to be in prayer with you over, um, feel free to continue to put those in the comments as we look at them during the week. But let us uh, go to God now in prayer. Merciful and gracious God, we do thank you for your presence in our lives, for your son Jesus who came to shepherd us, to be that good shepherd who watches over us, protects us, leads us where we need to go. Lord, it has been a long year where we haven't always felt like we knew where your presence was or where you were leading us, but we continue to put our trust in you to con continue to believe that you are with us and that you will see us through this difficult time. God, we lift up all of those who have been affected by the pandemic, those who have lost loved ones, those who have lost a business or lost their jobs, those who have been struggling with isolation and loneliness. Whatever ways, God, that we have been suffering during this year, we lift all of that up to you and pray that you would visit us with your mercy and your peace and comfort us as we continue on. But God, we also give thanks for the little signs of hope that are all around us, for the miracle of the vaccine, for the numbers that are declining, um, for just little glimmers of hope. We thank you for, for those gifts and for your presence that continues to be with us. Today, oh God, we lift up all of the prayers that have been named aloud, as well as the ones that remain upon our hearts. We pray for John Kerrigan and his family, for Margaret, for Mary, for all of those who are in need of your presence today, O oh God. Be with them, and may your spirit be with us as we continue to work for your justice in the world, as we continue to seek the diversity of your creation, as we continue to position ourselves every single day for your work of equality and justice. God, be with us now and be with us throughout this week. Bless our goings and our comings and bring us back together next week as we continue to worship and to seek your name. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. We come now to our time of offering where we have an opportunity to give back to God out of what God has given to us. If you'd like to give electronically to First United Methodist Church, the information is on your screen, or you can always mail a check to either church. Um, it is also UMCOR Sunday, and I'm going to try and put the UMCOR link in the comments, so if you'd like to donate to UMCOR, you can do that online as well. So let us sing now the doxology.
so we want to shout out to all of you who are worshiping with us today. It's so good to have each of you here. Uh, Casey Decker is here, Rick is here, Jenny and Jean are here, Lois, Bill Woods, Marge and Orion, uh, Karen Hendry, Sandy Garlic, Christina, Barry, Mary and Lacey Buckendorf are here, Betty Bricky, um, anybody else coming later? I know there's many more of you out there watching, so hello, good morning everyone, it's so good to have each of you here. All right, as I already announced, it is Umcore Sunday, and you can give online or give anytime during the month, and that will go to benefit the United Methodist Committee on Relief that does a lot of good work around the world, so we invite you to give to that. Um, as we talked about last week, um, our relaunching team has been meeting, and we sent out a survey to get some information from you about how you're feeling about coming back to in-person church. Um, so that survey was attached to this last Friday's email as well, as sent out a week ago. So if you could get that, fill it out, and send it back into us, we'd really appreciate it. Right now we're looking at the end of May to be a time to transition into some outdoor worship services. But we'd love to get your feedback on that. So send us your surveys, and that means, of course, that we will have a virtual Holy Week and Easter. And I know, you know, two years in a row is probably what none of us ever imagined, but um, it is what we're going to do, and we're going to make the most of it. So we have some awesome Holy Week kits that we're going to put together to make sure you have everything you need, like your palm branches for Palm Sunday and some butterflies for Easter and a little gift that we want to give to each of you. So those will be available for pickup uh, the weekend of Palm Sunday on Friday night, March 26th at Centenary and um, March 27th, Saturday, at First Church. And you can come to either church, whatever time works for you. Um, so I hope that you'll come and pick up a Holy Week kit to be prepared for our virtual Holy Week and Easter. Then we will have, um, of course, Palm Sunday. We'll have a live stream to worship service for you on Palm Sunday. On Good Friday, we will have a pre-recorded service. This will be very similar to our Ash Wednesday, where the service will be up on YouTube all day long on Good Friday, so you can watch it whenever it's convenient for you. Or if you'd like to worship with others in community, you can do that at 7 o'clock on Facebook. And I'm really excited about this service. It's going to be a modern take on the seven last words of Christ. And uh, there's three clergy involved, and we went to different locations in Salt Lake City for each of the different seven last words. And so we'll be able to kind of see how those words of scripture relate to our world today. So I, I commend that service to you on Good Friday. And then Easter Sunday, we will have a live stream, beautiful live stream worship for you with some guest musicians and it'll be a beautiful service. And then afterwards, if the weather is permitting, we are planning to do a socially distanced, safe outdoor picnic at Jordan Park. If you joined us in the summer for our picnic at Jordan Park, it'll be in the same place, just kind of out in the grassy area there. So I invite you to come, bring your own chair, bring your own lunch, and that way we can at least see each other a little bit on Easter and be outside together. Um, but our worship will be live streamed that day. So I think I went through everything. Um, all of this information was sent out to you during uh, the week in our newsletter. So you can go back there and check and get all the information and get it all in your calendar. Um, of course, today we have our Zoom fellowship after worship. I invite you to come and say hello. And then our Lenten book study is at 11.30 a.m. And next week will be our, our last Lenten sermon on our sermon series before we head into Palm Sunday and Easter. So we're glad that you're all here, and we hope that you will join us for these holy days that are approaching. All right. Now, as you go from this place, may you receive this benediction. May you know that you are not alone, but that the Good Shepherd is with each and every one of us. And may you go out into the world to shepherd those around us, to show love to your neighbors, and to work for justice in the world, for that is where we will find God. So go in the name and the peace and the love of Christ. Amen. <laughs>